Hello, this is Dr. Brian Weiss, and I have here questions that I'll attempt to answer from my Italian followers that have been sent in through My Life Italia in preparation for the three-day experiential workshop that I will be conducting in Roma June 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of this year, and I hope to see you there. Let us get to these questions. There are many. Unfortunately, I won't be able to answer all of them. Several hundred were submitted. So we've chosen some here, some to cover as much as we can. And the questions are wonderful. I hope the answers live up to the quality of the questions. The first one, and I'll read them and then answer, comes from Michelle, who asks, walking meditation is now a new trend. What do you think about it? Is it effective for past life regressions as well? I do jogging, and I would like to know if I can integrate this practice with a meditation to follow while running. Well, meditation has become so popular these days, and there are different types of meditation. So a walking meditation means that when people are walking mindfully, it is a form of meditation. When I say mindfully, I mean you're in the present moment. You're not thinking about the past. You're not worrying about the future. But you're mindful with everything in the moment, the sound of the birds, of your feet walking on the walk, how it feels in your muscles, all of your senses, just in the present moment. And it's a wonderful and healthy exercise. But I don't think it's best for regressions. Regressions are a little bit different. That's when you follow my voice or the voice of a therapist back in time to remember your childhood, infancy, in utero, or past lives. And it's different when you're doing a mindfulness meditation while walking. It's, it's a different sort of concentration. So I prefer when we do these regressions to do it in quiet where your body is in a deep state of relaxation, so deep that you cannot feel your muscles, your, you don't feel your body, you're deeper than that. And that's best for regression. And in walking meditation, you're walking so you cannot go as deep. They're both very healthy, both very useful, but they're not the same thing. So thank you, Michelle. The next question by Serena, is related and it's which is the best place where to meditate for you and I think for me for other people a quiet place a place where you feel peaceful where you can just tune out other noises distractions thoughts interferences this can be in your home in a special room or a quiet place somewhere where you're very comfortable and you can relax deeply and that's the key it does not have to be special in any other way. It is sacred, special for you. You can relax there deeply, and that's the place to meditate. But also a place that's free from interruptions, like telephones and other noises. So the quieter is better, peaceful is better, and you'll find intuitively what feels right, and that's the place you should meditate. Carlo writes, apart from past life visualizations, what are the benefits of meditation and regression? There are many benefits of meditation now, and science is proving this more and more. Relief from anxiety and stress, there are changes in the brain and the body. All of this is healthy. With regressions, when we look at past lives, we find where in the past traumas may have caused symptoms in your present life. For example, perhaps you have a fear of heights and you were thrown off a castle wall in the Middle Ages. You can then let your fear disappear. It disappears when you remember the cause. So for me, past life therapy has many benefits, both physical, mental, and spiritual. Physical, I mean, let's say you were hanged in centuries ago. Your neck will be better when you remember this. There is no danger. A mental or emotional, I mean, you have a phobia or anxiety. It comes from the past. And when you remember the cause, it disappears. And your life is freer without obstacles and impediments. 
and spiritual when you learn that you never die, that you're the spirit, the soul, and you go on after the death of the physical body, and that you have died many times in other bodies that you've had in past lives, and here you are again. It changes grief. It changes how you face life. It lets you let go of fears, not just the fear of death and dying, but other fears as well. So there are many, many benefits, Carlo, to this type of therapy. Luca writes, What do I have to do if, while I am following a relaxing meditation or a regression, negative emotions come up? And what if ideas and intuitions come up? Can I write them down? Or in doing this, I will risk to stop the flow. And Luca is right. Uh, I don't recommend that people write down during their meditation or regressions anything because that brings the left brain, the logical brain, into it and it will destroy the meditation or the regression. It will interfere with it. It will bring you up to full waking consciousness. So you will remember. It's a myth that people do not remember what they experienced during a regression. They will remember, you will remember. So in case a negative emotion comes up like anxiety or a fear, you will deal with it. You'll find the causes of it, you'll understand it, and through understanding, the fear will disappear and you'll be freer in your life. But don't stop the regression or the meditation. At the end, when you're finished, you can write down your experiences, everything that you remember, or dictate or record in some other way, but not during it. Stay in the deeper state until you are finished. When you come out, that's when to record whatever you need. So let's move on to more questions and answers. Francesca writes in, how can I lead negative people to stop affecting my positivity? If they damage my positive vision with their negativity, I will attract more negativity upon me. This question is also a very good question. What do you do when you're surrounded by negative people? We call some of these people vampires, energy vampires. They suck your energy out. So when you're around them, you may feel depleted, tired, because they're taking your energy or they're affecting your outlook. And Francesca, the best way is to not pay attention to these people, to just trust yourself enough that you don't have these people detract from you. If you need to leave a person who's a negative, critical person, send them light, send them love, and send them on, your way, on their way. Just send them, not with violence, but with light, with love. Let them go put a kind of energy or light shield around you so that their negativity just bounces off, doesn't get inside you. But don't take it seriously. You are a beautiful, wonderful, spiritual being. We all are. And other people should not be able to detract from your positive self-esteem and your good feelings about yourself. Don't let them do that. Gaetano writes, in a past life regression, I saw my current partner. Does this mean that he is my soulmate? But Gaetano, um, I talk about soulmates and write about soulmates in my books as people who have lived with you other lifetimes. You come around, we all do, in groups, family groups, soulmate groups, learning our lessons. Our lessons are love, kindness, compassion, nonviolence, spiritual growth, our connection to all living beings. And if this person has been with you in other lifetimes, then we can call them a soulmate. Now, I do believe that we have more than one soulmate. Maybe one is closer than all the others. Some people call this a twin soul. But we have many soulmates. They can be um, significant others, lovers, but they can be children, parents, best friends. You can have a teacher who's a soulmate. They come to you and you spend six months or a year and you go on, but they've affected your life. They've changed your life. Maybe they've 
pushed you a little back to your spiritual path if you've wandered astray. And so we have many soulmates, Gaetano, and if you've lived past lives together, I call you soulmates. Franca writes, I have read in the internet that your daughter Amy wrote a book and it will be released in Italy next spring. Is it about past lives? I miss so much books about this theme, Franca. Well, Franca, uh, yes, this is true. Um, our daughter Amy has written uh, a novel, a beautiful spiritual book. It includes past lives, but a lot more. Life on the other side, parallel dimensions, free will, destiny, spiritual planes and dimensions, healing, healing grief, all of the concepts, concepts, all of the concepts that I've written about in my books, and mine are all non-fiction books, but Amy is a beautiful spiritual novel. The book is called Crescendo. It will look something like this. And crescendo, because this is how the soul grows to this high peak and we approach our destinies, our spiritual destinies. Uh, I've read this, I love it, I'm looking forward to it. It should be released this spring, probably around the beginning of May, more or less, and I hope you are able to read it and benefit from it. And thank you very much for this question. Um, two questions that are related by Eduardo and Beatrice. Beatrice. Eduardo writes, I am quite shy, but I want to attend your next event here in Italy. I am just afraid to have a block while meditating near so many people. What do you advise? And Beatrice writes, I am attending your next seminar here in Italy, and I would like to prepare myself at best. What would you advise to do in order to come as ready as possible to follow your meditation during the event? Uh, for Eduardo, uh, it's better not to worry. You don't have to worry about being blocked while meditating or regressing around so many people. Your eyes are closed. It's quiet. There'll be soft music playing. It doesn't matter if there are five people, ten, or a hundred or five hundred. It's really the same. And sometimes the energy of the group is so powerful that it helps people to have regressions and meditations. And so we've never found that interferes. Often it helps. It's not your only chance. Now, the nice thing about the workshop in Italia is that it's three days. So this gives a lot of time to practice, to go deeper. And many people who do not have an experience the first day have a very powerful experience the second day or the third day. So this cumulative effect will happen. Try not to worry. But you don't have to end when the Italy workshop ends on June 4th. You can keep practicing. So we have uh, CDs and downloads and other things that you can keep practicing with at home after the event. But you have now know what it is. You've been practicing, going deeper, and eventually you'll be successful. In my experience, about three quarters of the people will have experiences, regression experiences or spiritual experiences or healing experiences during the workshop. But many of the quarter that doesn't have experiences in the next days or weeks after the workshop. Sometimes it comes in dreams. You're dreaming uh, after the workshop and the answers come because the door has been opened during the workshop. So don't worry about that, Eduardo. And Beatrice, um, there's no real preparation. Come in relaxed. If you want to practice with my CDs or tapes before then, that's okay too. But everything that you need to have is provided at the workshop. And as I was speaking to Eduardo about a moment ago, just being there, practicing, doing the exercises, most people will have some experiences. So let's move on. We have uh, three or four more, and then we'll finish for now. And again, thank you for these wonderful questions. Moreno writes in, Hi, when does a soul incarnate into a body? During the birth or at conception? Thank you. I chose this one because this question has come up many, many times, and I don't have necessarily an absolute answer. 
all of my answers just involve my own research and experiences with patients. So it's my opinion. And my opinion is that around the time of conception, a reservation is made between the soul coming into the body and, and, and the mother and the baby's body. So that's a reservation. It's like making a reservation in a hotel. And then the soul comes in and out during gestation, during those nine months, more or less. A soul can come in and out, be on both sides at the same time, all of these things, uh, so that the soul can be outside and inside. But around the time of birth, it's locked in. So then that soul, which made the reservation nine months previously, has that body, those parents, this lifetime, to continue learning its soul's lessons. So that's how I look at it now. This was told to me by many of my patients over the years. Um, I answer this one from Ulysses because I'm kind of in this category myself now. Hi, Dr. Weiss. At 70 years old, is it still important to know our past lives or just about the last one for the time left if I still have some time? I think it's always good to know about your past lives. At 70, at 80, at 90, it doesn't matter. It's never too late. There's still really good time left. And this helps you understand fears and anxieties and doubts. It brings more balance and purpose and meaning into your life. It's never too late. 70 is young. And I may be biased about this, but many 70-year-olds have had wonderful experiences in the workshop. So don't let age get in the way. Um, Graziella writes, when you make a regression, which life do you connect yourself to? Is it up to our higher self or is it the last life we have lived? And what does it happen in between lives? Graziella, <clears throat> I'm answering your question because I find in my experience that people go to those lifetimes where they have lessons or healing. For example, if if you have a physical or emotional illness and remembering the past life will heal you, that's the one you'll go to. It may be your most previous, most recent past life, but it could, it could also be one from centuries or millennia ago. It's wherever you need to go for healing to take place, for understanding to take place, so that you can get rid of those symptoms. In between lives, we keep learning, we plan our next life, we rest, we recuperate, we, we go over with our spiritual group or committee, and we'll do exercises in the Rome uh, workshop, meeting with your spiritual committee to make this pathway even more clear. And then we decide the conditions for our return, which parents, with family, how we can keep learning our lessons, whichever lessons you're working on, patience, nonviolence, love, compassion, whatever the lessons may be, greed, charity. We know the lessons, but sometimes humans are a slow species in learning. And this is um, very evident in our world today. And the last one we'll do today is from Isa. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Isa writes, why are so many lives cut young? Why are there so many victims at war and natural disaster? Is it all part of the soul's destiny or is it just an accident? Does it have a meaning coming to the world and then leaving before completing our path? Well, I, I don't think these are accidents, Isa. I think there's a destiny at work. There's also free will. So how do you, the two of these combine? Well, the key people that you're supposed to meet in your life, you will meet. This is destiny. But your reactions to these destiny points, this is the free will part. For example, you might meet a soulmate, someone that you had contracted to spend years with and learn lessons together and work together in a cooperative way. And then you meet and you decide, well, this person's from the wrong social class or the wrong religion or lives too far away or my parents don't approve or whatever it is, and that affects your decision and perhaps you'll make the wrong decision. That's the free will part. The meeting, that takes place. That's destiny. What you decide 
That's the free will. And they both exist. They coexist. I think when young people die, this is part of their soul's journey. They're learning. I'm not saying that it's always written in stone because I feel that there are probably parallel lifetimes and every time you make a choice, you go off into one of these alternate dimensions, but it's all about the soul's learning. And if you know that you are immortal, you're eternal, all of your loved ones also, you never die, you're always being reunited, it's not as tragic as it seems here, even though it is very difficult and there's still grief. Amy, in, in her book Crescendo, describes this in a beautiful way that makes it much more clear than I'm explaining right now. So I, I hope you have the opportunity to read her book and that will answer your question uh, even more directly. But that's my brief answer for now. Well, I want to thank all of you for writing in, for providing these beautiful questions, for listening to these answers now. And I look forward to seeing as many of you as I can in Roma, in June 2nd, 3rd, and 4th of this year, and we can continue these discussions, have regressions, have more experiences, and work along our spiritual pathways together. Until then, Arrivederci. Mm -hmm.